Hello students, welcome to Geology Classroom. In this class, uh, we shall learn about origin, salient features, and adaptive radiation in reptiles. Reptiles are the first uh, vertebrates that came onto land and uh, managed to live successfully on uh, terrestrial habitats. And uh, they are creeping or burrowing animals, cold-blooded animals. Uh, they are um, having uh, epidermal scales or scutes. These uh, ectodermal or cold-blooded animals are found uh, mostly in the warmer parts of the world. Very few reptiles are seen in colder parts of the world. Mostly these are terrestrial animals. Some are, uh, uh, again, they return back to the waters. And uh, about 600 living uh, reptiles have been identified by the scientists so far. And uh, before uh, we move to classification of reptilia, it is uh, very important to, to have some idea of the reptilia skulls. Why? Because the classification of reptilia is purely based on the type of skull present in the uh, reptilians. So in determining the skull, some basic information we should keep in our mind. So here uh, you can find six skulls are there, but uh, only there are five types of skulls. And in each thing, you are seeing a bigger one the, in the uh, anterior region of this skull. This is called as a optic lobe or uh, orbital. It is called as orbital. So in this orbital, eyeball will be located, eyeball will be placed and uh, this is not uh, considered as a uh, uh, temporal fossa. So temporal fossa are the holes which are present on, uh, on the temporal region, a temple region. So here in this thing, you are seeing this hole. Here, this is uh, one hole and this is not having any hole. Here is also one hole is there. This is having two holes. So we are seeing only one side of the skulls here in all these pictures. So on the other side also, they will be having again, orbital and uh, uh, another set of uh, these holes are temporal fossa will be there. So based on this temporal fossa, the reptilian skulls have been uh, skulls have been classified into synapsida skulls, paropsida skulls, anapsida and uriopsida and diapsida skulls. And anapsida skull is considered as the primitive skull of the primitive reptiles in this thing the temporal region is not having any fossae or any holes in this thing. So, and uh, next four types of things uh, out of them, out of those four types of skulls, only one is having two pairs of uh, uh, fossae and uh, remaining three are having one pair of fossae. So, to determine what type of skull it is, we can say if two pairs are there, undoubtedly we can say it is diapsid, but uh, to determine what type of skull it is, uh, whether it is uriapsid, synapsid, or paraapsid. So as all these are possessing only one pair of fossae, but how to determine these skills, uh, these skulls? So here you have to remember, you have to identify the four bones in this skull. So out of these four bones, uh, you are seeing this thing for the big hole. This is orbit in which eyeball will be placed. So, so immediately behind the eyeball, post-orbital bone will be there. And uh, uh, behind the post-orbital bone, squamosal bone will be there. And above the post-orbital, post-frontal will be there. Post-frontal bone will be there. And uh, behind the post-frontal, supra-temporal bone will be there. So it is about the temporal region, so that it is called as supratemporal. This postfrontal is behind the frontal region. Frontal region is the uh, immediately behind the frontal bone. So this is the frontal bone. So behind the frontal bone, it is postfrontal. And uh, below this postfrontal, postorbital. Why? Because it is behind the orbital, so that it is postorbital. And behind postorbital, squamosal. Above squamosal, supratemporal. So these four bones are very, very important. If you identify these four bones, then it will become easy for you to determine what type of skull it is. So if the single temporal fossa is in between this postorbital and squamosal, then it is called as synapsid skull. 
and if the single fossae is present in between prefrontal and suprafrontal bones then it is called as parapsida skull and if the prefrontal is uh, above this post orbital and squamosal okay above the post orbital and squamosal then it is called as uriapsid so in uriapsid and synapsid the single pair of uh, temporal fossae are in between these things only post orbital squamosals only but here the post orbital squamosal is forming upper arch it is forming arch on the temporal fossae here in uriapsida it is forming arch on the lower side so lower arch that otherwise we can say these two bones post orbital and squamosal bones are below the temporal fossae here post orbital squamosal are above the temporal fossae this parapsida it is uh, having all the four bones below it post frontal supra temporal and uh, post orbital squamosal all four bones are below this temporal fossae so by understanding these positions of these bones you can easily identify so these are the five types of skulls and uh, so there are different groups uh, present in this reptilia class so in what group what type of skull is there it is present in this uh, <clears throat> uh picture so an apsida skull is present in cartilosaurians and chelonians chelonia include all turtles and uh, uh, terrapins and uh, uh, all tortoises and this cartilosauria they are extinct now and another uh, skull uriapsida skull it is found in plesiosaurs they are also extinct parapsida skull is present in ichthyosaurs these are also extinct diapsida skull is present in present day currently living as spinodon snakes lizards and crocodiles and extinct dinosaurs also and the synapsida skull is present in pelicosauria they are extinct and uh, theropsida theropsidans are also extinct but the uh, successors of theropsida are living now they are uh, mammals so mammals are also having synapsida skull now let us see the classification of reptilia so the reptilia class is uh, classified into several subclasses they are anapsida naptosauria ichthyopterygia lepidosauria archosauria and synapsida in anapsida uh, three orders are there cartilosauria this is considered as the primitive group in reptiles or stem reptiles they are extinct now mesosauria these are also extinct now this mesosaurians uh, uh, they again uh, they return to water so they were aquatic uh, uh, reptiles and chelonia they are, are presently they are living now <clears throat> in synaptosauria proto uh, protorosauria saraptorygia and uh, placodontia all these are extinct now in ichthyopterygia ichthyosauridae so all ichthyosaurus uh, organisms are also extinct now they are also aquatic animals in lepidosauria eutsuchia rhynchocephalia squamata and this squamata <coughs> includes lesertilia ophidia and uh, amphisbenia so this uh, squamatans rhynchocephalians are living now eutsuchia are extinct in archosauria all are extinct except crocodilia thecodontia sarishia arnetischia tirosaria all these are extinct except this crocodilia and synaptira synaptida includes uh, pelicosaria theropsida these are also extinct now so coming to the early reptiles so the early reptiles are also called as proto reptiles they were originated around 312 million years ago during the carboniferous period Uh, they have originated from the advanced reptiliomorph tetrapods or advanced reptiliomorph amphibians so from the reptiliomorph amphibians these early reptiles they were originated and uh, these uh, early reptiles they adapted to, to live on dry land or uh, uh, terrestrial habitats the early reptiles some of the examples include the early reptiles are lizard like uh, hylonomus this picture is hylonomus another one is cassinaria this is cassinaria 
So these two are the primitive reptiles. Examples for primitive reptiles. Apart from this, many different types of uh, reptiles also uh, evolved later. Then all these reptiles, uh, including the present day reptiles, they are possessing some features that they have developed a cleidae egg. Uh, this is very, very important one. Why the amphibians failed to live on land completely, permanently, is that they were not having a cleidae egg. So their egg was having a very delicate outer layer so that that delicate eggs can easily be dried up uh, or they will be subjected to desiccation. So that eggs will be dried up and uh, the offspring cannot come off those eggs. So that's why in order to protect their eggs from desiccation, uh, from drying up, the amphibians, they have to go back to water bodies during the reproduction season. But these reptiles, they have successfully uh, formed a cleidoic egg. So the cleidoic egg, they, it will have a hard shell. All the uh, eggs we are eating, the fowl eggs, uh, all those eggs are also cleidoic eggs. So the cleidoic egg will have a, uh, a very uh, hard shell outside it so that uh, the uh, inside uh, uh, liquid cannot be dried up or desiccated. So, Cleidoic egg is very, very uh, um, major change in order to survive on land completely. And uh, in that egg also, they have developed some extra embryonic membrane out of them. Amnion is a very, very important one. So this amnion has created a mini ocean inside the egg. Why? Because without the water body, no organism can develop. So embryological development also requires a water body. So that water body, uh, uh, a mini ocean is created inside this amnion. That's why only the organisms are able to uh, develop in the embryonic uh, stage. And uh, they have lost the aquatic larval stage. Amphibians, they were having the aquatic larval stage. The larvae used to live in the water. But these uh, reptilians, no larval stage is there directly from the eggs. Uh, a baby reptile comes out of it. And all these uh, early reptiles were small in size. And they look like lizards and all, the, all of them uh, are insectivores. Uh, they do not measure more than 20 to 30 centimeter long. So they are very small. And they were having numerous sharp teeth. So the sharp teeth only uh, uh, makes us to conclude that they were insectivores. And uh, they were having hard scales of scoots uh, or, or scoots on their skin. So these scales and scoots are very, very important. This is uh, another adaptation to land life or uh, terrestrial life. Why? Because amphibians, they were having a, a moisture filled uh, skin or very soft skin. So the soft skin also makes them uh, easily dry on terrestrial habitat so that they compulsorily, they have to live in and around the water bodies only or under the crevices or under the stones only. So they cannot freely walk on the uh, dry areas, the amphibians. But these uh, reptiles, they have developed a very hard uh, skin in the form of uh, by having scales and scores so that water evaporation will not be then water evaporation is prevented with the help of the scales and scores so that the reptiles were successfully living on the dry areas also. And the brain size was uh, increased, especially cerebrum and cerebellum regions increased in size when compared to amphibians. The size of these parts in the brain are uh, lesser than the birds and mammals, but when compared to amphibians, uh, a considerable uh, increase has been taken place in the size of the cerebrum and cerebellum. So this uh, increase in the brain helped them to successfully live on the land also. And uh, the earliest uh, reptiles, they also gave rise to this uh, primitive ones are called as cartilosars. And later these cartilosars, uh, uh, the cartilosars, they were having anapsida skull. And later from anapsida or cartilosa, synapsida skulls were also developed. So the synapsida reptiles also were came into existence. Even though all these uh, anapsids and synapsids, uh, 
they were uh, overshadowed by the labyrinthodont amphibians at that time by because at that time at that period of time the labyrinthodont amphibians were the dominant species on land by because they were big in size so that they were very small in size so that they were not the dominant creatures of that time and they remained a small inconspicuous part of the total fauna until after the small ice age uh, at the end of the carboniferous so after this carboniferous period is uh, finished later the uh, <coughs> mesozoic era started in the mesozoic era these reptiles uh, became the dominant animals on the planet earth that's why this mesozoic era is called as age of reptiles so most of the earlier reptiles uh, anopsid synopsid uh, megafauna disappeared uh they were replaced by archosauromorph diapsida skull uh, reptiles uh, by this meso in this mesozoic era and this archosauromorphs are uh, archosaurs they were characterized the characters of these archosaurs include they were having elongated hind legs and uh, they were having an erect pose and early forms uh, of these uh, archosaurs they look like somewhat uh, long legged crocodiles and the archosaurs later they became the dominant group during the triassic period and later they developed into dinosaurs and pterosaurs as well as the ancestors of crocodiles so the ancestors of crocodiles are also uh, developed from this archosauria group some of the dinosaurs were largest land animals ever lived on this planet earth and uh, some of the smaller theropods uh, uh, were also present uh, in the smaller theropods later they gave rise to first birds so birds were uh, developed from this theropoda group of uh, this uh, reptiles the sister group of archosauromorpha is lepidosauromorpha from this uh, in this lepidosauromorpha squamata group and rhynchocephalians uh, developed from this lepidosauromorpha only the remaining lepidosauromorphs are extinct but uh, the squamata and rhynchocephalians are existing now and the phylogenetic placement of other main groups of fossil sea reptiles such as uh, ichthyopterygians including uh, ichthyosaurus species and the sauropterygians uh, the placement of these two groups ichthyopterygians and sauropterygians uh, they evolved in the triassic period early triassic period but the placement of these animals is very more controversial so in which group they have to be placed uh, placed uh, uh, on this topic on this issue scientists are not having a uh, uniform or a consensus on that uh, uh, issue so different authors link these groups to either to lepidosauromorpha or to archosauromorpha so some kept this uh, ichthyopterygia and sauropterygia in lepidosauromorpha and some other groups put them these two groups in Uh, archosauromorpha so no consensus no uh, unity is there among the scientific community on this topic so it is uh, a controversial issue and anatomical changes that happened uh, that take place that took place uh, during this morphosis or uh, transition of amphibian to reptilia what are the changes occurred in this early reptiles so body developed a covering of epidermal scales to prevent the water loss from the body and skin glands are also lost by because skin glands are also causing uh, ca causes to the loss of body moisture so losing the skin glands and developing scales and spots is the major change skull became monocondylic uh, amphibians were having dicondylic but these uh, all the reptiles are having monocondylic skull so this monocondylic skull uh, has a um, advantage over dicondylic skull in that uh, a monocondylic skull has the better movement and flexibility so that uh, neck can be moved uh, in more uh, angles the atlas and axis are the first two vertebrae this first two vertebrae also they are permitting the skull to move in many directions so this is also another change limb bones and girdles also they became stronger but limbs were attached on the sides of the body and uh, belly touched the ground during the creeping mode of the locomotion as they became big in size so they cannot uh, completely bear the total weight of the body so that belly touched the ground during the creeping tactile region in the uh, hind legs uh, 
uh, after Hinleg spot, the two strong and fused vertebrae are there. So this uh, fused vertebrae, they are giving support to the body weight on the hind legs. And pin, pentadactyl limbs develop claws uh, and the claws also help them in climbing the rocks and climbing the trees. And uh, having this class on the limbs also, this is a major change. A lung respiration became more efficient than the amphibians. As a water conservation strategy, metaniferous kidneys excreted uric acid, which did not require water for retention. So amphibians, they are living uh, in and around the water body so that they secrete either, they excrete either uh, uh, urea, urine with ammonia or urea. But these are completely living on land so that water has to be conserved. For that purpose, they have chosen this uh, uric acid as a major nitrogenous waste material. So that helps them to conserve a lot of water uh, in order, uh, that will prevent them to lose the water in the form of urine. So uh, that, is, that, may, that is made possible with the uh, development of metonephrous kidneys. So metonephrous kidneys also major change that also help them to live successfully on land. And reptiles uh, like amphibians, they continue to ectothermal only or uh, uh, <coughs> stenothermal only. And uh, since why? Because ventricle is not completely partitioned in these airing organisms. So that mixed blood is flowing in these animals like uh, amphibians also. That's why they also remain uh, ectothermal like amphibians. So this is not a change. This is a continuation of amphibian character. Internal fertilization evolved. So amphibian, most of the amphibians, uh, almost all amphibians practice external fertilization in water. But uh, in this reptilia, internal fertilization evolved. As a result, large cleric eggs uh, with shells uh, were laid on the land. And embryonic membrane, development of embryonic membrane like amnion, allantoin, yolk sac are also very, very big changes that help these reptiles to survive on land. And coming to origin of uh, reptilia, so amphibian origin is one theory. According to this theory, early reptiles originated from some primitive labyrinthodont amphibians uh, in the beginning of Carboniferous period. So the transition was so gradual that often it is difficult to decide uh, uh, whether a fossil uh, is a reptile or amphibian, advanced amphibian or primitive reptile. So we cannot uh, clearly say so that much uh, gradual transition was present in those fossils. The labyrinthodont uh, amphibians, they possess uh, some labyrinthine teeth in them. So these labyrinthine teeth having the foldings inside uh, the teeth. So enamel has many foldings inside the teeth. So that's why they got this labyrintho labyrinthine name. And these labyrinthine teeth are also present in Crassoterian uh, ancestors of the uh, those amphibians. So these uh, labyrinthodons flourished through Carboniferous and Permian periods. Later, they became extinct in Triassic period. Probably these amphibians, uh, these early reptiles arose polyphyletically along a dozen or more independent lines. So uh, scientists uh, agreed upon this thing that all the uh, reptile organisms, all the reptiles, they did not evolve from a single ancestor instead. Uh, different ancestors gave rise to different groups of the reptiles. So that is called as polyphyletic evolution. And stem reptiles are called as cartilosaurs. So during the Carboniferous period of the late Paleozoic era, about uh, 250 million years ago, some labyrinthodon amphibians gradually took on this uh, reptilian characters. So the earliest reptiles are called as stem reptiles. These are also called as cartilosaurians. They belong to order Cartilosauria of the subclass Anapsida. Anapsida skull was present in them. So they were contemporary to the primitive amphibians of late Pennsylvanian and early Primitian, uh, early Permian times. So in the later part of the Permian period, uh, however, the amphibians were uh, outnumbered by these reptiles. So at the end of the Permian period, uh, these uh, primitive uh, reptiles uh, overgrown in number than these amphibians. So this is a uh, uh, Captorhinus aguti, a cartilosarian uh, fossil. Two cartilosarians are there. So these are the stem reptiles. And ancestry through Saimuria. 
So one of the Cartilosaurian was Simuria. It was found in lower primitive sediments in Texas region in America. Uh, that is estimated as a 250 million years old fossil. And uh, this Simuria was a lizard-like animal. It grew up to 60 centimeters in length. And uh, the body was a compact lead, a very thick body. And uh, head was very small. And uh, the head has a dorsally placed nostrils and a short tail was present in that fossil. It has few reptilian features like anopsida skull, single occipital condyle, monocondylic skull, and a large parietal eye and five digits. So structure of Semuria was intermediate between amphibia of that time and the early reptiles. So this is the uh, reconstructed uh, diagram of Semuria. And uh, the Semuria leads us to certain logical conclusions that it is not directly ancestor to all the reptiles. So uh, why? Because it was uh, living at the time of reptiles uh, had already been present some 50 million years. So uh, by the time of this Semuria, reptiles are already came into existence 50 million years ago only. So that we cannot say that uh, reptiles evolved from this Semuria. It is so perfectly intermediate between an amphibian and a reptile that it is a true, its true position is remains uncertain. So uh, where it has to be kept, in which group it has to be kept is not yet uh, concluded. So Romer, uh, uh, scientist Romer treated uh, this Simuria as a reptile under order Cartilosaria, uh, whereas other scientists uh, classified uh, this Simuria with primitive amphibians under Simuriomorpha group. Of Semuria is a connecting link between Labyrinthodontia and Cartilosaria. So, this is uh, again uncertain. And ancestry through Limnoskelis. So, this is Limnoskelis. Limnoskelis was a genuine reptile. So, no controversy is there on this thing. It lived in Carboniferous uh, in a time of early Permian in New Mexico region of today. And Romer uh, studies this uh, fossil a lot and he suggested that. This is a Coptirinomorph cartilosaur and it is a primitive reptile, according to Romer opinion. And this lim limnoscalis was about 5 feet in length, uh, some half of which was made up of uh, tail only. So in this 5 feet length, 50% uh, of uh, length was made up of tail only. And uh, remaining body is elongated body and uh, they are loose lung and short stubby legs and uh, they sprawled outward from this side. So the legs are uh, outward the body. And like Simuria, it was also aquatic in habitat. And the skull of this uh, is belonging, uh, is of uh, an oxida type. And uh, the skull was compressed from side to side and the dorsal ventrally flattened. And otic notch uh, present in the labyrinthodons uh, had disappeared in this uh, uh, limnocellus. So that uh, point indicates that uh, back of the skull uh, in the region of its skull uh, closure. And uh, pre-maxillary teeth were enlarged and overhung in front of the teeth in the lower jaw. So the arrangement of this pre-maxillary teeth, this is additional bone, was not present in any other. So the arrangement of this pre-maxillary bone uh, <coughs> was most common in the early reptiles, but it was not seen in amphibians. And other members of these primitive, primitive reptiles are Aptorinus and uh, Hylonomus. So, and ancestry through Diadectis, uh, these are the Diadectis reconstructed models. Diadectis was contemporary to Limnoscalis, but the diad uh, Diadectomorphs represents different evolutionary line from this Limnoscalis. These uh, organisms retained the otic notch of, at the backside of the skull. Uh, they had developed a specialized dentition and the front teeth were chisel shaped and back teeth uh, had broad ridge crown. So this is a peculiar feature present in that teeth. Uh, the first really large reptiles to make their appearance in the uh, later Permian period uh, were these uh, Periosaurus and uh, that related to Diadectis only. And these diadectians, they were having a spiny excrescences on the head region. 
uh, in spiny armor and uh, of bony plates along the back. And uh, these armor and uh, plates, uh, probably they help them in defense against the carnivorous mammals like uh, reptiles. And some workers, including Watson, um, are of opinion that these cartilosaurians separated into two divergent evolutionary lines. In those two divergent evolutionary lines, one line is uh, represented by the Propterino Marfa. Uh, it is a suborder uh, in which uh, Limnocellus was primitive man member. And uh, from these organisms, uh, mammal like reptiles evolved later. Ultimately, mammals also evolved from them. And that group is called as Theropsida. So, other line is Sauropsida. From this Sauropsida, uh, this direct uh, evolved. So, uh, this uh, second uh, group of cartilosas is called as Sauropsida. And from this Sauropsida, remaining reptiles and birds evolved. So, in this Sauropsida group, they were, were having the uh, Arctic notch, uh, but this uh, earlier group in this uh, Captorino marfans, uh, uh, this limnoscalis. So, uh, in this, this belongs to Captorino uh, in them. Uh, this Arctic notch was absent. And uh, it seems clear that the modern reptiles are not intermediate in the evolutionary sense between amphibians and mammals. And to find out a common ancestor for a creature like a lizard and a mammal, uh, we have to go back to an ancient reptilian or possibly to an amphibian, according to uh, Watson. So, from which group of organisms they have evolved uh, is cannot be told as of now. And adaptive radiation uh, in reptiles. Adaptive radiation is a process uh, by which uh, organisms uh, diversify rapidly uh, from an ancestor group into a different types of groups. In the, in terms of forms and in terms of uh, physiology. So particularly when uh, a change is there in the environment, so in order to adjust to the changes in the environment, uh, in order to utilize the new resources available in those new environments and uh, to face the new challenges, all these things, they help these organisms to uh, gain new characteristics. Starting with the single ancestor, this process results in the speciation and uh, phenotypic adaptations of an array of species uh, exhibiting different morphological and physiological traits. So, a best example for this feature is this Gala, uh, is can be seen in Galapagos Islands uh, in terms of uh, Darwin Finch evolution. So characteristics of this uh, adaptation, adaptive radiation, this thing already we have discussed in previous classes, so I'm not going to repeat it. Conditions also we have discussed in previous class, so I'm not going to repeat it. You can, if you want, you can uh, watch that uh, previous video, amphibian video. And uh, adaptive radiation in this early and mesozoic reptiles. So these ancient reptiles uh, gave trials to all sorts of ponds and ways of living. Some of them, uh, like Therosaurs, uh, they became aerial uh, reptiles. And Ichthyosaurs and Plesiosaurs, they went back to water, so they became aquatic organisms. Some sauropod dinosaurs, they were amphibious, so uh, they were living in water and uh, as well as in terrestrial habitats also. And the dinosaurs were cursorial. So they were fast runners, and uh, it is assumed that the some of the Mesozoic reptiles they also adapted to fossorial and arboreal life. That means uh, uh, just like the monkeys, how they are living on completely on trees uh, like that. Some reptiles are also were adapted to this fossorial and arboreal life also. So out of all these things, cartilosaurs uh, they are also called as a Captorhinidae. So, this Coptorhinidae reptiles are cartilosas, or stem reptiles are considered as the primitive reptiles, stem reptiles. So, these from these uh, cartilosars only, they have uh, entered into different types of habitats. So, after entering into the different types of habitats, they have developed different types of characters in them that led to the differences in the shape and forms and the physiology of the organisms. So that led to, to the adaptive radiation. And the primitive cartilosaurians, the uh, characters of these organisms are the skulls were very strong. 
they had teeth uh, that better able to deal with tough plant materials. So the cartilosarians were uh, uh, this part uh, <clears throat> uh, herbivorous in uh, nutrition type. And the postcranial skeleton is very similar to that of the advanced reptiliomorphs amphibians. They had a broad, robust skull, and uh, the skull was usually triangular in shape when seen from the dorsal view. Pre maxillae were characteristically downturned, and uh, early smaller forms possessed a single row of teeth, uh, while later, uh, later forms like uh, Captorhinus and Herbivorus, Moradisaurus, they possess multiple rows of teeth in them. So from this uh, early cartilosaurs, different types of uh, groups have been evolved uh, as an adaptation to the different environments they entered. So the tenosaurs, they are arboreal, they are aerial organisms, they are exhibiting a lot of uh, flight adaptations. Their bones were hollow and air-filled like those of the birds. Uh, this provided the uh, air-filled bones provided them higher flight attachment surface for the, uh, their skeletal weight. The bone walls were uh, often paper thin and they had a large and keeled breastbone for flight muscles. And enlarged brain, uh, they were having enlarged brain that enabled them to coordinate complex flying behaviors. And the tyrosa skeletons often show considerable fusion. So the fusion of these uh, skeletons help them uh, include the sutures in the skull. So all the bones diffuse to form single bone-like skull and the between elements also disappeared in the skull. So the fusion of this thing also contributed, uh, uh, it is considered as an adaptation to flight. In seeing some later tyrosas, the backbone also over the shoulders fused into a structure called as notarium. This notarium structure served to stiffen the torso during the flight and provides a stable support for the shoulder blade. Likewise, sacrum vertebrae also they were fused to form synsacrum, just like birds. Uh, the synsacrum gives a support to the hind limbs. And another group uh, of uh, debrates, uh, they developed uh, aquatic adaptations, uh, that is ichthyosaurs. They grew up to 16 meter in length. They were very big in length. Uh, they were very large size uh, uh, dinosaur or uh, ichthyosaurs. And their limbs had fully transformed into flippers, uh, which sometimes contain very large number of digits and phalanges in the flippers. So some of these uh, ichthyosaurs possess a dorsal fin. In this picture, we are not seeing a dorsal fin, but some of them were having dorsal fin also. Uh, the heads of uh, these organisms are pointed. Jaws often were equipped with conical teeth. And uh, the presence of conical teeth or sharp teeth uh, tells us that they were uh, carnivorous and those teeth uh, help them to catch the smaller size prey. Some species had large giant blade teeth. Uh, uh, the large giant blade teeth helped them to attack the large animals. The eyes were very large. Probably the big, uh, big eyes uh, helped them in uh, deep diving in seeing the uh, surroundings in the deeper regions of the waters. Neck was very short. And later species, they had developed a uh, stiff trunk. And uh, they also had a more vertical tail fin. This vertical tail fin, uh, fin helped them in powerful propulsion strokes uh, while swimming. Vertebral column, uh, it was made up of a simplified disc-like vertebrae. And uh, it continued into the lower lobe of the tail fin. And uh, they may have a layer of lumbar also, uh, which helped them in the insulation process. <clears throat> And uh, they mostly they resemble the present day dolphins and whales. The dolphins and whales are mammals. So when the dolphins and whales, they were uh, evolved uh, due to the walls, uh, whales, dolphins, and these ichthyosaurs were living in the same environment due to convergent evolution, same kind of body structures developed in these two different groups. Next one is plesiosaurs. They are also aquatic uh, reptiles. So they also exhibit many 
after aquatic adaptations uh, that these aquatic adaptations developed uh, as a part of adaptive radiation they were having small heads and very long and slender necks and uh, the long and slender necks help them in cruising in the water uh, that help them to move with their head uh, in position to snap up uh, and very fish and cephalopod organisms to us to to capture the prey organisms the long neck help them a lot and uh, some of the plesiosaurs they were having very short necks so two different groups are present one group is having uh, long necks another group is having small necks so the long group next uh, group the group of long necks are called as plesiosauromorphs while the short neck forms are called as plesiosauromorphs so two different names were given to these organisms and this uh, plesiosaurs uh, they had uh, they had a broad flat body and a very short tail their limbs were uh, having uh, four long flippers Uh, which were covered with strong muscles attached to the bony plates and uh, these bony plates were formed by the shoulder girdle and the pelvic girdle and uh, flippers uh, made a flying movement through the water and they breathe air and uh, they also uh, bore live young uh, animals so and at the beginning of the so they were not uh, uh, eglaeus or uh, uh, <laughs> oviparous organisms and uh, at the beginning of the late cretaceous uh, the ichthyosauria became extinct uh, perhaps uh, a plesiosaur group evolved to uh, fill the niche and ornithischia so ornithischians are called as uh, uh, bird hipped uh, herbivorous dinosaurs the anatomical adaptations include uh, they were having a horny faces this triceratops uh, see this is triceratops it is having horny faces and uh, uh, armored body uh, as you can see in thyreophora so this is thyreophora so they were having many armors on their body so all these things are anatomical adaptations as they are herbivores to prevent uh, escape from the attack of uh, carnivorous animals they had developed all these ornaments uh, or uh, armature in this ornithischians they have a unique bone called the predentary bone to give a beak like apparatus used to clip off the plant material so all these organisms uh, uh, in their lower teeth they were having a special bone called as a predentary bone so usually dentary bone will be there so but predentary bone is a special bone so it is present uh, uh, in the front region of the dentary bone so that dentary that predentary bone gives them a beak like appearance this uh, predentary bone also helping them to clip off the uh, plant material to eat and they had paired toothless pre toothless uh, pre maxillary bones on the upper jaw and uh, development of a narrow eyebrow and uh, palpebral bone uh, across the outside of the eye socket also present in them jaw sockets were lowered below the level of the teeth they had a leafy shaped cheek teeth and the backbones were stiffened near the pelvis by the ossification of the uh, often uh, done above the sacrum and uh, had at least five sacral vertebrae attached to the pelvis so this is the uh, these are the adaptations uh, taken as a part of adaptive radiation in arnetischia group so another group is sarishia sarishia and are called as a uh, lizard hip dinosaurs and they were having a three pronged pelvic structure so this is the pelvic structure so pelvic bones pelvic girdle is having a three uh, <coughs> three pronged structure whereas this ornithischian having a four stranged uh, 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 this pelvic uh, bones are present in them so in this organisms the uh, pelvis bone pelvic structure the pubis this is the pubic this is pointed for in forward forward direction whereas in ornithischian the pelvic region it is also having a Uh, this backwardly directed uh, branch so it is uh, bifurcated into two branches so this is one more difference and ilium also 
uh, it is uh, different in this Arnithischia and uh, Sarishians. So these are the big changes uh, that occurred in these organisms. So these uh, Sarishians, they walk like lizards, but these Arnithischians, they walk like uh, birds so that uh, they are called as uh, bird hipped organisms. And these are called as, uh, Sarishians are called as uh, lizard hipped dinosaurs. Both are the part of the dinosaur group only. So in dinosaur group, two groups are there. One is Sarishia, another one is Arnithischia. Arnithischia name uh, suggests that um, probably birds have originated from this uh, group, but that is not correct. So this is a development of bird-like walking uh, that take place in this uh, pelvis region of bones. But the modern day birds actually evolved from this Sarishia group only. So while the evolution or origination of the birds from this Sarishia group, again, the pelvis bones again, they again, they got the same modification that were occurred in this Arnithischia group. So this should be, this thing should be kept in mind. You should not forget this thing. Arnithischia name may mislead us to think that birds are uh, originated from this group only, but that is not correct. But birds evolved from this Arishia group only. Why? Because uh, name also suggests that and this uh, arrangement of these uh, pelvic bones are also very similar to the birds, but birds did not develop from this group. Birds developed from this Arishia group only. So in the, this Arishia group, uh, in this thing, uh, two, again, subgroups are there. One is herbivorous sauropoda. These herbivorous sauropodans are quadrupeds. They walk on four legs. And another group is, uh, another group is uh, chiropoda. These theropodans are bipedal organisms. They walk on hind limbs only. And these are carnivorans. So now let us see uh, the adaptations that took place in the sauropodans. They are walking on four, le uh, four legs or four limbs. Herbivores, quadrupeds. The teeth uh, is in shape of a spatula. And uh, very tiny heads are there, but uh, very long necktails are present. And these long necktails help them to capture the uh, branches of the uh, many plants as they are herbivores. So in order to collect the plant material for eating, these long necks help them a lot. And very massive bodies uh, were present in all the sauropodans. And these are amphibious in life. So they used to, mostly they used to live in the water bodies. Why? Because as they have developed a very large massive body, so bearing the own weight of the, this total big body was became very hard for them. So that most of the time they spend their life in water only. Now when then only they used to come onto land. So when they are in water, the water only carries the weight of this body. The organism need not to carry the weight of that uh, own body. So that's why mostly they used to live in water body. So that uh, feature uh, led them to live a, a amphibious life. And hind limbs uh, were uh, large and the thick, they were straight and powerful. And uh, they uh, end in a club-like feet with five toes. And uh, only inner uh, toes, in large three toes, uh, three toes uh, were having claws. Out of five toys, only three toys were having class. And uh, four limbs coming to four limbs, they were very slender when compared to long legs. Uh, four limbs are very slender. Uh, their endings uh, were like uh, pillars, uh, like hands, and uh, they built uh, for the supporting weight. And uh, they were having only one claw in the thumb bone only. And uh, proximal caudal vertebrae are very, very special in these organisms. And uh, this uh, special uh, structures are diagnostic for the sauropods. And some sauropods, they also had armor in order to get protection from carnivorous animals. And Theropsida, this is the group that includes carnivorous, dangerous uh, Tyrannosaurus uh, uh, rex or T. rex uh, dinosaur. So they are bipedal, they walk on the in limbs only. And uh, they are very sharp animals. They're very quick uh, in movements. They, they were having a slicing teeth or beak and well-developed class. 
cloud hands were present and uh, usually the class uh, only three class will be there in their four limbs and the hind limbs uh, hind limbs are very strong uh, help them for running large eyes were present these large eyes help them to have good sight and asymmetrical fingers uh, the three fingers in the hind limbs and four limbs are also not symmetrical in size they were of different length and uh, long and mobile neck was present in them they walk on the three toes of the large hind limbs and four limbs also had three fingers but uh, uh, out of them one is opposable like our thumb and uh, this opposable thumb help them to grasp some food material uh, and the jurassic uh, period allosaurus uh, was the monstrous carnivore uh, which grew up to 10 uh, meters length and the largest was tyrannosaurus rex or t rex uh, yeah, this was shown in the Di jurassic park movie and uh, this tyrannosaurus rex uh, uh, grew up to 15 meters in length and uh, the height of this uh, organism was up to 6 meters and uh, its head was dis uh, disproportionately great uh, with uh, large jaws armed with dagger like uh, teeth and uh, each teeth uh, measures up to 15 cm long uh, three toed uh, massive hind legs were adapted for running and extremely short four limbs were almost useless for running or walking the very short uh, four limbs uh, help them in grasping the uh, food or uh, prey organisms only so these are the adaptations uh, that taken place uh, in order to their living life so with this uh, we have finished the reptilian part uh, in next class we will meet with another topic till then bye